I have grown children, and I suspect many of you do. In fact, I almost now have grown grandchildren. And how do we perceive our adult children? Um, it's, it's a bit tricky to them and to us. Uh, I uh, graduated from uh, seminary, got my degree uh, fairly late compared to a lot of people. I was almost 35, and uh, my hometown church in Baltimore was looking for an associate, and they asked me to come and be interviewed. I found out in my home church I'm still known, I was still known in those days as Jimmy. I wouldn't have much good, been much good to them, I didn't believe anyway, and I told them so because the neighborhood was changing. And back in those days, that made a big difference in how the church was serving the community. And instead of uh, reaching out and really getting an associate who were, would match the community as it was becoming, they decided to move out of town. But I was Jimmy. I'm about it in my generation. I do have a, a few, there's none above me in my generation, and I suspect some of you looking around, you understand that as well. Uh, I do have some cousins left who are my generation, and to them, I'm still Jimmy. Jesus evidently had that problem. Is this not Joseph's son? At an introduction of his public ministry, that was his advent in his hometown of Nazareth, Jesus stood up to read, and as you heard, he, he asked for the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. In, in the synagogue services, there were basically two readings usually, one from the Torah, the first five books of Moses, and that was prescribed. It was whatever that Sunday, or that Saturday, excuse me, whatever that Saturday prescribed, that was what was read. But the reading from the prophets could be anything of the preacher's choosing. So, I, so Jesus himself chose the scroll that had Isaiah in it, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Jesus identified himself as the one to which the prophet was pointing, the one to be anointed by God. That had to be startling. He was saying, I'm Messiah. I'm the one whom Isaiah was pointing forward to. It was earth-shaking. And then he goes on to continue the reading where it describes what the Messiah was anointed to do, what Jesus was anointed to do, to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to bring good news to the oppressed, those who are oppressed by others, who were bullied by others in whatever way that bullying took place, who were oppressed by poverty, perhaps, by hunger, by the imbalance of the system, maybe even oppressed by sin in their own life. And as I thought about these different categories that Jesus mentioned, good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, I thought about the incidents that Luke describes for us later on in his gospel in the life of Jesus and, and how they fit those categories. I love that story in, in Luke chapter 7 at the end where there's this fallen woman perhaps prostitute, rejected woman in the town, whom we don't know how, but somehow she met Jesus. And then she shows up at the place where Jesus is having dinner at the home of a Pharisee named Simon. And she falls at his feet. You may remember the story. She weeps over his feet. She wipes them with her hair, which she lets down. It's a very moving scene of love that she expresses for him. 
And Jesus turns toward the woman, but he speaks to Simon. He said, did you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, as it should be obvious to you, Simon, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. The one who, to whom much is given loves much. One for whom little loves little. And then Simon and the rest of them there said, Who is this that even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. I love the passages in the gospel where Jesus is said to have compassion on people. And this is one of them in Luke 7. He approached the gate of the city of Nain, and a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and he said to her don't weep and then he came forward and touched the bier and the bearer stood still and he said young man I say to you arise and the dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him back to his mother to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners release Another wonderful story in Luke is in the next chapter. Jesus is in the area across the Jordan, mainly a Gentile area. And there was a man there who lived among the tombs. Nobody could restrain him anymore. Even with a chain, he had often been restrained with shackles and chains. And the chains, he, he wrenched apart and the shackles, he broke in pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. And night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and cutting himself, and bruising himself with stones. And you know the story, I hope. Jesus liberated him from the legion of demons that had possessed him. And people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, and I love this line, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They couldn't restrain him with chains. Nobody could subdue him. All night he's howling and bruising himself. And then there he is, sitting, clothed and in his right mind to proclaim liberty to the captives. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament. That was a time when those who had sold themselves out because they had come into poverty were freed, given their freedom. That was where the whole economic system was reversed, where things had gotten out of kilter, where the, the rich were getting richer, the poor, poor. And the imbalance was straightened out. That's what happened in the year of Jubilee. Now that has, requires the state to make things right. Jesus was not in a position, nor did he want to be at that point, to make things right as only the state could to restore the economic system. But we know where he was headed. Again in Luke, there was a rich man that Jesus tells about in a parable. He was dressed in purple, really expensive stuff, fine linen. He feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus. We don't know the name of the rich man, but we know Lazarus' name. He was covered with sores. 
He longed to satisfy his hunger just with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. He evidently went the other way. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm in agony here in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime, you had all the good things. And Lazarus in like manner all the evil things. But now he's comforted here. And you are in agony. The people didn't like what Jesus was implying. The hearers moved from surprise to indignation to outright hostility. They didn't hear Jesus' announcement. I'm the anointed one. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I stand for. To them, it wasn't good news at all. We would say today was fake news from their point of view. Isn't this Joseph's son? We know you. We know your family. We know where you were brought up. Uh, some of us even think you're Ill illegitimate. Who do you think you are? And Jesus responds, I tell you that a prophet is never accepted in his own hometown. Why is that? Because they speak truth to power, and the power's right there. They tell their neighbors what's right and what's wrong, and some of them don't want to hear it. They take it personally, and it is personal, when it's right here, right now, right in our midst. And then Jesus points out the acts of Elijah and Elisha. My goodness, there are plenty of widows that were hungry in Israel, and there he goes someplace else and provides food for a widow in Zarephath. There are plenty of lepers in Israel, and yet it's Naaman the Syrian who gets healing under the watchfire of Elisha. They ministered, you see, to, I hate to say it, to Gentiles. Now you have to understand how that was an anathema to these people. Jump forward a, a couple decades and you have Paul. Paul's arrested. He, he's threatened by the people. and The Romans have to protect him and arrest him. And then he's allowed to, to give his argument to the people who were angry with him. The Jewish people who were angry with him there at the temple. And he tells them, I, I fell into a trance, and, Je and I heard Jesus saying to me, hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they'll not accept your testimony about me here. And I said, Lord, th they know what a good Jew I've been here, after all. They know that I put the Gentiles who followed Christ and others, Jews that followed Christ in prison, I imprisoned them, I beat them. I stood by while Stephen was being stoned. I, I held the coats of those who killed him. But then Jesus said to me, I send you far away to the Gentiles. Now up to that point, they heard him gladly, we read. And then they shouted, this fellow is not fit to live. There's no way that God could be gracious to the Gentiles. We always have trouble <laughs> thinking that God can be gracious with people with whom we disagree or people that we don't like. I mean, I can understand how I can be gracious to me and to you, but, you know, to those people. And that was their problem, and it was a lot stronger than we, we can even imagine today. 
If only they had received the message and the messenger. The passage in Isaiah goes on to say they'll be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities. The devastations of many generations. They'll be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord to display his glory. When we follow God's ways that Jesus outlined here, that Isaiah outlined, that Jesus put into practice, we're, we're really becoming what God intended us to be, imitators of Christ, those who are able to glorify God. We're actually of some use to God. Oaks of righteousness. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. They'll actually get something done. They'll, they'll have a purpose, a real purpose. They can accomplish far more than they can even imagine. That's what happens when we receive the message and when we believe it and when we practice it. Now, Jesus omits some of Isaiah's prophecy. You may have noticed that. He stops at a particular place. If you compare Isaiah 61 and Luke 4 here, you'll find that there's a place where Jesus leaves off. And the next line is this one, to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't include that. The first time Jesus came, he didn't come to do that. We all love those verses in John, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. When he came the first time, he didn't come to condemn. Of course, we're already condemned in a sense because we're all sinned and fall far short of the glory of God. But he didn't come to point that out. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to love us and to die for us. That's what he came to do the first time. So he didn't read this about the vengeance of the Lord. However, when he comes again, his second part will be fulfilled, the day of vengeance of God, the day of judgment, we call it. John describes it, or saw a vision of it in Revelation chapter 19. He saw the heaven opened and a white horse. and Its rider is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, many crowns, and he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in robe a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven wearing linen, fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, a sword of judgment, a sword, a sword that has nothing but truth, and it cuts both ways, with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh as a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We don't like that image. I like much better that he came not to condemn but to love. I don't like the idea that judgment is sure. We prefer the love of God. But the vengeance of God is important too. It sets right all that's been wrong. It gives justice to the poor, the persecuted, the oppressed, the abused, the murdered. And it's true justice. It's right justice. It sets right all that's gone wrong in this world. Fortunately, the, the prophecy doesn't end there. This is the end. To comfort all who mourn to provide for those who mourn in God's house to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, 
the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. The passage I read to you about judgment comes from Revelation 19 and Revelation 21. John heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the home of God is among his people. He'll dwell with them. He'll be with them. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more and mourning and crying and pain will be no more. The first things have passed away. That's when the rest of the prophecy in Isaiah will be true of Jesus, the anointed one, when he comes again. And that's why from its origin, the church has cried out for Jesus to come again. The book of Revelation ends with, right before, a short benediction with these words, Surely I'm, I'm coming soon. And the people respond, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, we do thank you for sending your Son to love us, to bind up that which is broken, to soothe that which is hurting, to care, to have compassion, to love us as no one ever could love us. And we also, Lord, yearn for the day when you come to set aright all that's wrong in this world. So we look back with thanksgiving for the first advent, and Lord, we look forward to your second advent. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come. Amen.